Dan Sanding from uh, the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction. Welcome to our April Friday Forum. Uh, we're very happy to have Chris Fulton here from uh, RMS, uh, who will be giving us a very interesting presentation on wildfire catastrophe modeling. We're, we're really looking forward to hearing what he has to say and having a good discussion afterward. Uh, so a brief introduction to Chris. Uh, Chris is a senior director of product management at RMS. He's responsible for specialty uh, analytics, including uh, analytics associated with wildland fire, uh, wildfire terrorism, casualty, marine cargo, and builder's risk. Uh, Chris has a pretty extensive background in both the uh, broker and carrier sides of insurance, and he's both a licensed broker and a chartered property and casualty underwriter. Uh, so once again, we're very happy to have Chris here, and uh, we have an extremely large audience today, I think over 100 people, um, and so we're looking forward to some good discussions, some good questions after the webinar. Uh, for those of you who don't normally sign in, a uh, quick reminder, if you'd like to ask questions, please do so using the question and answer function that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please ask questions throughout the webinar whenever, whenever a question comes to mind. Uh, but we'll be collecting all the questions and, and having a discussion at the end uh, of the presentation. So we'll save uh, questions until the end of the uh, end of the presentation. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it to uh, I'll pass it to Chris. Great, thank you very much, Dan. Uh, so uh, again, my name is Chris Falkman. I'm from RMS. We're based in Newark, California, and we build catastrophe models. Uh, most recently for a wildfire. Uh, and focusing on Canada. Um, so it's certainly a timely peril, and over the next uh, hour or so, I would like to take the opportunity to uh, review the modeling and analytics process and some of its challenges, uh, talk about opportunities for better insight and risk management strategies for this very challenging perils, um, and also uh, address some of the drivers of risk and why we've been experiencing the elevated risk levels that we're seeing today. Um, so I guess I will start by just showing a, a simple uh, graphical representation of why we are here today. Um, there's an alarming trend in loss severity in North America, the Can Canada and the US over the past 30 years. Uh, from 1960s until 1990, wildfire just wasn't that big a deal facing the insurance industry. It uh, resulted in less than $100 million per year, and that's in today's dollars, uh, of loss of the insurance industry. But then something changed. And in the early 90s, stretching into the uh, early part of the new millennium, there was an increasing frequency of severe losses. Uh, an outbreak. And then again, over the past decade or so, we're seeing something new emerge and something changed again. Now, there are several factors driving these trends, and we're going to review them today. But in light of this kind of loss, one thing is for certain. Uh, the, the insurers, policymakers, homeowners, uh, land use planners need to get more serious about risk management and analytics uh, for this peril. I would say comparable to how we are all approaching other similar perils uh, like flood, hail, uh, hurricane, earthquake, severe convective storms, stuff like that. Because given the size of the loss that we have seen from wildfires all over the continent, uh, wildfire certainly can be considered somewhat of a peak peril in parts of Canada. And now we need to treat it like such. So this is the contents of what I'd like to cover today. Um, some of the drivers of this severity of loss and risk uh, that I just mentioned. Go over the modeling process. Uh, some of the challenges that we face and the opportunities to really change the game and get a greater understanding of this peril with regards to hazard, fire hazard, uh, vulnerability, that is how, how fire damage is structured, um, and mitigation, what we can do to reduce uh, the risk of wildfire. Talk a little bit about current practices in wildfire risk management and lay the groundwork for a probabilistic framework 
a framework that that uh, greater uh, accommodates all of the probabilities and the uncertainties of fire risk as a means to quantify the risk going forward into the future. And then at the end, as Dan mentioned, we're going to open it up for uh, whatever Q&A you might have. So I'll start with talking about one of the, the major drivers of risk and loss, and that's simply exposure. <clears throat> simply put, in high risk areas, we are seeing more houses being built, more population uh, coming in, and more value at risk than just a se uh, several decades ago. Now, what you see here is the, the Wildland Urban Interface. That's a mouthful. It's referred to as the WUI. The WUI is a zone typically used to designate areas of high risk in Canada. There's also a WUI in the United States. And there's a specific technical definition for the Wildland Urban Interface, the areas in purple that you see here with regards to the amount of exposure density needed and the amount of uh, uh, the concentration of vegetation. <clears throat> but simply put, the, the WUI, this zone, is where the wildland and populated areas mix together. Uh, it's a very desirable place to live. This area has easy access to nature with at the same time all of the amenities of urban areas. And compared to uh, densely populated urban areas, it can be somewhat more affordable to live in. Um, I, the, the definition that I like the best is from, the, from Mary Walsh at the New York Times, who describes these areas as quiet scenic realms where towns and cities end and forests, grassland, or scrublands begin. The problem that we face today is that population is growing in these areas, and that means that wildfires, which 30 years ago would have been caused minimal losses to the insurance industry, can now cause very substantial losses because of that population shift. Now, <clears throat> looking back at fire activity in Canada over the past 40 years or so, you can see in this slide by the blue areas, that a substantial amount of land mass in Canada has burned at least one time. Canada has a high incidence, a high frequency of wildfire activity. And as long as there's growing exposure at risk and this continued high frequency of fire, <clears throat> wildfire risk is something that Canadians will need to contend with for the foreseeable future. Another driver of risk is the amount of burnable vegetation, the excess of burnable vegetation, or as we refer to the fuel landscape. The North American continent has a denser abundance of flammable vegetation today than it did a century ago. And I live in California, and there are some uh, writings of the great naturalist John Muir who describes uh, our gem Yosemite National Park as the kind of forests that you could ride a horse through. The kind of forest that you could ride a horse through. The last time that I was in that national park, I could barely walk through those forests. So the density of timber and of vegetation is just fundamentally different than it was uh, a century ago. Um, the forests are also more uniform spatially and that is really ideal for fire spreading conditions. And there are less fire resistive species. Now, the reason for all of this, at least partially, is attributable to uh, really aggressive fire suppression uh, in North America in the 20th century. There were, you know, a lack of controlled burns, an absence of more holistic forestry policy, leading to a buildup of, uh, of burnable vegetation. Now this has changed over the past 20 years. A lot of it has been fixed. Uh, we are now on the course to a much, much better, uh, uh, more holistic management of our forests. But still, a century of this different policy uh, is something that's going to take a while to reverse. 
Um, and there will be an excess of burnable vegetation for quite some time. Now, <clears throat> I won't deny that this topic has recently been the subject of some very charged political narrative, particularly uh, in the United States. And the discourse has been oversimplified, the statistics have been misquoted, uh, and I think quite frankly, some information has been selectively used in this narrative. Suffice to say, there is some very good research and policy making that is happening both in Canada and in the United States. In Canada with NRCAN, Natural Resource Canada, um, which is doing some very, very valuable research that will enable better policy making decisions. Um, and also in the US with the US Forest Service, uh, which is part of the Department of Agriculture. Um, both of these bodies are actively addressing the problems of elevated fire risk. And I think both are, are seeking optimal solutions and mitigation strategies that really work the best. So the third uh, important contributor to wildfire severity is that we have a changing climate. Now, every major wildfire starts with an ignition, one or more ignitions actually. And an ignition requires specific conditions to be met in order to be successful. The, the vegetation needs to be dry. Uh, the temperature needs to be high. There needs to be low ambient moisture. And in order to uh, change an ignition into a full-blown fire, much less a catastrophic fire, there needs to be sustained wind. Uh, not just gusty wind, but sustained high winds. Um, to enable that fire spread. Now, as we face warmer temperatures uh, and hot, dry summers and more frequent extreme weather conditions like seasonal winds and droughts and stuff like that, all leading to knock-on effects of elevated tree mortality, as you can see here in this slide, and fire seasons, which are much, much longer than they used to be. The combination of all of this is that we are going to face more ignitions. And within more ignitions, there is a greater chance for much bigger, severe events to occur. So with this as the context, this is how we propose approaching the quantification of wildfire risk. Uh, we have a team of fire scientists, of structural engineers, of statisticians that have been working on this problem for close to three years now. Um, and uh, what we are introducing is a 50,000 year climate and ignition simulation. Now, if you simulate the climate, today's climate for 50,000 years, uh, certain climate conditions in certain locations will yield to an ignition. And each ignition is then fed to a fire spread model. And fire spread simulation is a truly massive data exercise where you're simulating the, you're reading in uh, to a simulation the slope, the terrain, the vegetation, the moisture, the wind, the fuel, and the temperature at incredibly high resolution, as high as 50 meters for, the, for all of Canada. Um, so we're talking petabytes of data that simulated over 50,000 years, uh, yielding millions of individual fire footprints uh, that generate and provide this long-term view of risk. And all of these results at the end of the day can yield some insight. Now this insight can be used in the insurance industry for things like pricing, uh, capital management, management of you know, balance sheet concerns, portfolio management, uh, reinsurance purchase, accumulation management, setting risk appetite guidelines, and things like that. Now, a lot of this on the business side seems straightforward, 
but the framework of the model itself is very, very complicated. These are truly models within models that are needed in order to uh, provide an accurate view of fire risk because a fire is a pretty complicated thing. It throws off a lot of smoke and smoke can travel in very different ways leading to uh, additional living expense claims from evacuation orders and in Canada evacuation is a big thing. You have a very high volume of evacuation orders as we've seen uh, from several fires over the past couple of years that leads to business interruption. Uh, it leads to a lot of contents claims from smoke damage. It's, it's, uh, it's a very important part of the overall fire. And then embers. Embers are an incredibly important mechanism of fire spread. They are the means by which fires jump roads, jump rivers, uh, and the embers land downwind and then they start new fires. So they enable the fire spread. If those embers, instead of landing on vegetation, land on rooftops, and the roofs start burning, they can result in what's called an urban conflagration, where you have a house to house fire taking down entire neighborhoods. And those are very severe conditions that we unfortunately have seen occur over the past three years. Um, and these are very scary because at this point, the fire doesn't need any vegetation to burn. The houses themselves are the source of fuel. And when the fire starts jumping from house to house, it can elicit somewhat of a, a domino effect, chain reaction, taking down entire neighborhoods. It's a phenomenon that we want to study uh, much more closely because it is a very severe uh, byproduct of these large fires. And then finally, um, a, a very interesting and complex part of fire modeling is on the financial side. Uh, because many of you have been involved in, in reinsurance purchasing and in, in reinsurance treaties, uh, they define what is a wildfire occurrence in sometimes different ways. And in the reinsurance world, they are going to be changing up the ways that wildfire events are defined, uh, subject to certain hours clauses, that is all of the fires burning within 168 hours or seven days are considered a single one event. Same thing, spatial clause. We've seen a 100 mile radius, so any fires burning within the same 100 miles are to be considered part of the same event. But there's a lot of talk in the reinsurance industry of changing that number and making it bigger, such that all fires burning in a particular region, maybe even province, could be subject to being grouped into a single event. Now, the impact of that really needs to be taken into account on what ultimate loss would be. So, how fire ignites and spreads and causes damage is inherently complex. And it takes a lot of computational capacity to characterize this accurately. But there are three components that comprise wildfire hazard. The radiant heat, that is the flames, the burning embers, and an ember is basically a burning chunk of fuel that is usually lofted into the air and travels downwind, uh, and then the smoke. Now, <clears throat> the, what's burning in terms of the radiant heat hazard is dependent on what kind of fuel it's burning. If it's timber that's burning in a canopy fire, that's fundamentally different than a fire that's caused by uh, burning shrubs or grassland. What kind of terrain influences the hazard? Um, slopes are dangerous things, uh, fires love hilly terrains. They can travel downhill very fast. If they're traveling uphill uh, towards a structure, they can sort of preheat the structure such that by the time the flames reach the structure, the ignition probability is a lot higher. Um, how fast the fire is spreading um, and how intensely it's burning, how much energy it's throwing off, measured by this thing called the energy release component, ERC. Those two things determine the overall level of heat hazard. And the, the energy released by a fire combined with its rate of spread is yields, when you multiply those two things together, it yields this number that's very highly correlated with this, the size, the length of the flames. That's how we can understand heat hazard. Um, ember hazard, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, depending on what kind of fire is burning, uh, 
Embers can be as large as pine cones. They can be as small as small coins. <clears throat> but uh, that uh, how embers burn and how they travel um, is influenced by things like wind and moisture. And then smoke, the smoke damage. Fires cause smoke. Smoke causes damage both within the fire footprint as well as far beyond it. So <clears throat> these how, this is how things combine together to provide the heat hazard, the amber hazard, and smoke hazard. And when we run our physical simulations, those are further combined <clears throat> into burn damage and smoke damage. So we would imagine that insurers will be running these things together and separately, and that some coverages uh, such as smoke sublimits um, might be introduced into the market in the next couple of years um, based on the different kind of damages that different types of fires create. Now, this is a visual representation of the factors that influence wildfire risk and behavior. Uh, you can see here, this is a house in the Cascade Mountain Range that burned, uh, that, was, uh, that had a wildfire in its vicinity just a couple of years ago. And you can see as the fire is burning towards the house, these are all the variables that are influencing how the fire forms, spreads, travels, and ultimately damages structures. The heat intensity, the slope that the house is on, the embers that the fire are throwing, the smoke that it's emitting, and then some site level characteristics like the distance to flammable vegetation and the fuel type. <clears throat> In retrospect, this homeowner could have probably done a better job at vegetation management uh, around the perimeter of his or her house. Uh, distance to flammable vegetation, defensible space is a very important influencer of wildfire hazard uh, and mitigation. But as it turns out, the house was just fine. It didn't burn. <clears throat> it probably sustained some smoke damage. But other than that, the homeowner could return to this house the next day. And the randomness, this really underscores the randomness or the seeming randomness of fire behavior. And it shows the reason why in order to get it right, we have to simulate tens of thousands of years, millions and millions of fires in, or, in order to generate patterns out of the model. And it's once you start going through millions and millions of fires, some patterns start to emerge that can tell you the difference, the dangerous side of a single neighborhood compared to the safe side of a neighborhood. Using these patterns that emerge out of the model, that's how we get insight that can be used for underwriting, for mitigation, and for risk reduction. I mentioned there's a lot of contribution to fire damage from these burning embers, these burning chunks of fuel. And some safety organizations uh, estimate that up to 90% of home ignitions and wildfires are caused by these embers landing, you know, on roofs, in gutters, getting through vents, going through openings, open windows. Once that happens, the ignition probability of a structure increases very, very quickly. The other thing about embers is that, you know, without the presence of the flaming fire front, these embers can travel far beyond the fire. And, and we're talking kilometers and kilometers beyond the fire. And they can land on houses completely outside the fire footprint and cause 100% damage if, a, if there is a successful ignition. What you see here is the Wenatchee fire, where the flaming front on the right side of the slide ended at the top of the hill, burning uh, basically entirely that first row of houses. Um, but you can see that embers traveled 
uh, were lifted into the air by the convective updraft of the fire. They traveled downwind and they landed on houses that otherwise would have been considered clear of the fire footprint and caused near total damage. Um, and that simulating this ember travel is a very important part of fire modeling um, because it is a very important component. Now, when embers uh, in, a, in a timber fire, in a canopy fire, travel um, and land on recipient fuel downwind, they can start new fires. And this is a phenomenon known as fire spotting. Um, fire spotting was first studied uh, in the 1970s in earnest and is now uh, an area of very active research. Uh, ember travel and this spotting phenomenon is influenced by a couple of things. First, uh, the fuel, what is burning, and usually this, this spotting happens in a uh, timber-dominated fire. Uh, there's a lot of timber in Canada, so you will see a lot of ember travel. Um, by moisture, the ability of these embers to travel downwind and not burn out while they travel is influenced by the ambient moisture. And of course, the wind. The stronger the wind, the further the embers will travel. And in academic literature, um, there are sort of observed instances where embers can travel by uh, as much as 10 kilometers down in very, very strong winds. So ember, dangerous concentrations of embers uh, can go way beyond the extent of the fire itself. Um, as I mentioned, embers are the, the vehicle by which big fires jump natural barriers like roads and rivers. They start new fires or they burn houses. And they are very important to having a holistic understanding of wildfire risk. Now, how embers damage structures is an area of very active fire research right now. Um, ember vulnerability, there's a lot of money going into that research. There, You'll see a lot of publications about this coming out very soon. Um, the, uh, the IBHS, the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety in the U.S. has a, a giant warehouse research facility in South Carolina <clears throat> where they have this contraption that you see in this slide here, which is called an ember blaster. And they basically take embers of certain sizes, they blast them at homes, uh, and then they replace the home. This is just kind of a, a siding of a house. And then they'll replace the roof, and then they'll replace the gutters, and then they replace the cladding, and then they toy with different uh, window openings and different flavors of structural characteristics and construction practices in order to see what is safest and what is most fire susceptible to this ember travel. Um, and so there's some very good research going on. Uh, we, were, we leveraged some of that research in calibrating the vulnerability uh, portion of our wildfire model, um, but it was something that we had to focus on a lot because embers are such a fundamental part of uh, understanding a structure's outcome to a certain degree of wildfire hazards. Now, in how fire is modeled, uh, its spread is simulated, and its risk is understood, there are some differences and similarities between how the government authorities do it in the U.S. and in Canada. Um, there's been some great research in, in uh, both countries. Uh, and over the years, they've sort of developed uh, each their own different systems for characteristics of fire behavior. And I think some of those differences have, have emerged out of uh, the fact that the fuel landscape is, is pretty different between the U.S. and Canada. Um, but both systems uh, use similar inputs in terms of things like weather conditions. Um, Canada has many more fuel types. Um, you know, in 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 studying the uh, uh, the fuel characteristics uh, of Canada, 
you know, I, I like to say that there are, there are more types of conifer trees than the Eskimos have words for snow, but it is very diverse in terms of the timber landscape. Um, and that is why I think there's a, a lot more uh, finely characterized fuel characteristics in the uh, Canadian fuel system. Uh, and that presents somewhat of a modeling challenge as well. Um, but I think one of the most fundamental differences is uh, Canada, the, the fire prediction and behavior system is, is really largely based on empirical data um, versus how the U.S. does it um, based on lab uh, observations and sort of a, a physics-based approach. Um, but there are some very good learnings uh, from each of them that we were able to uh, leverage and learn from in the parameterization of our model. Now, this is a fire in the U.S. I think for the North American continent, this fire was kind of a definitive wake-up call for both U.S. insurers and Canadian insurers. Um, I think it was one of the first real wildfire super cats um, that happened, at, you know, after uh, the Fort McMurray event. Uh, so it happened in 2017 um, in the wine country in California. Uh, happened peak fire season, sort of in October uh, 2017. All told, it uh, resulted in 11 billion U.S. Uh, insured loss, more than 45,000 claims. Um, it was a an absolutely devastating event. Um, the the most severe of the three simultaneous fires, which are collectively referred to as, I guess, the, the wine country fires, uh, was the Tubbs fire. Um, it was long thought that the cause of the Tubbs fire was uh, our electrical utility, uh, PG&E, but just recently um, uh, they announced that in fact it was not uh, a power line, it was a, a faulty electrical job by a private contractor elsewhere, so that is uh, brand new news. Um, but the Tubbs fire started um, in, in the hills above the city of Santa Rosa. Uh, there's lots of open space, there's some cattle, there's lots of wine in these hills, but very quickly it spread downhill towards town. And each one of these red dots represents one destroyed structure. So you can see as it traveled south uh, into town, it started to destroy a lot of structures. And by the time it reached the city limits of Santa Rosa, um, there were entire neighborhoods that were wiped out. Now. I think the defining moment of this terrible fire um, was when it reached the Highway 101. Um, the Highway 101 is this kind of, you see the gray line that sort of bisects the town of Santa Rosa here in the middle of the slide. My mouse is going over it right now. Um, this highway is four lanes of traffic on each side plus a big shoulder. So it is a very, very wide concrete barrier that in any reasonable, by any reasonable circumstance should prevent a fire from crossing it. Um, but because of the embers uh, burning and the windy conditions, those embers were picked up into the air and they started traveling over the highway and they landed on a, a small group of houses on the other side of the highway in the Coffee Park neighborhood. Um, and because of the wind, those houses started burning, the house, the fire started burning house to house, where houses uh, ignited other houses, which ignited other houses. And within 90 minutes, the entire neighborhood was gone. This is 1.5 billion US of homeowners exposure. And it was gone in 90 minutes. The fire started about three o'clock in the morning. It ended at 4.30 in the morning because the wind just died out and that was it. But this was the wake up call for the PNC insurance industry because all of these houses that you see here in this slide were considered low risk. They were classified as low risk. The maps showed them as low risk. The data products at the time showed them as low risk. What happened here? This neighborhood was completely outside the wildland urban interface. It was not designated as high risk by the CAL FIRE 
uh, maps, the, the maps that the California State Firefighting Agency publishes. Um, but what happened was this neighborhood was the recipient of uh, Ember Travel, and it was the most devastating urban conflagration in history. And it didn't need burnable vegetation. There's not a whole lot of vegetation in this neighborhood, but the houses became the fuel. And this was the wake-up call for the insurance industry that, that said, we need to get real about how we measure and quantify and mitigate this risk because the current tools that we have available to us are not cutting it. All of these houses were insured by the admitted market. It was not excess and surplus risk. It was not the market of last resort, the California Fair Plan that, that guarantees coverage to everybody. It was just plain vanilla, uh, low risk stuff. And, and I think this was kind of the clarion call uh, for better analytics in the industry for the wildfire peril. So this is a little more uh, of the um, how the embers and the urban conflagration works. This is a recreation of the, uh, uh, the coffee park event that I just showed where every dot on the slide represents one destroyed structure. You can see that on the other side of the highway, the embers were burning and they were being transported by wind. When they are transported, they're transported in sort of a, they're dispersed in sort of a conical manner, as you see here. And they traveled <clears throat> about two kilometers because the winds at the time were upwards of 70 miles per hour. Extreme winds. These are seasonal winds called the, 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 uh, the Diablo winds. Uh, which occur very commonly between September and December of every year. Um, but you can see that multiple embers were burning and they were all being transported to the same area downwind. So you had lots of embers that were all converging on the same basically block or two of houses uh, on the other side of the highway. And when you had that many embers landing on very few roofs, that's what caused these roofs to ignite. And that was the initiation of the urban conflagration. And once you have houses, burning houses, burning houses, the only thing that will stop the fire is either the fuel runs out or the wind stops. That is the only thing that will stop the fire. And in fact, 90 minutes later, the, the wind just kind of died down. If it had not died down, we wouldn't just be talking about this neighborhood. We could be talking about the next door neighborhood as well. So a big learning point for our models. So that's embers. The, the final part of uh, modeling fire hazard is smoke. Um, it is too important to ignore because it can it can contribute 20, 30 percent to a single event on an event loss, particularly in areas of high exposure concentration. Um, it contributes far beyond the burn perimeter. It can go 15 or 30 kilometers beyond the burn. You can still have smoke claims. Now, one point of distinction is that the way that we model smoke, smoke can travel thousands of kilometers, quite frankly but it is not going to result in an insurance claim a thousand kilometers away. The, the amount of smoke, the concentration of smoke that's gonna result in an insurance claim is gonna be much greater and much closer to the fire footprint. Um, but how smoke is concentrated and how it damages houses is dependent on three things. First, the, the emission of it, so if grass is burning or trees are burning, that's completely different in terms of the amount of smoke it emits and how intensely it's burning. Now the second is dispersion model. You know, smoke first travels up and then it travels out. So depending on the convective uplift and the wind conditions, that determines how far it goes and how far a very dangerous plume of smoke uh, can cause damage beyond the burn footprint. Um, but, and then finally, the smoke footprint itself is basically uh, a, a particular dosage of contaminant that's going to result in something like contents replacement or decontamination or evacuation orders that result in additional living expense. Uh, it's very specific. But you can have a very high volume of very difficult to adjust claims uh, from smoke. 
um, because you know when you have thousands and thousands of claims for a low uh, low dollar amount, um, you know for something like contents replacement, which is kind of hard to adjust, then you have opportunities for claims inflation. Sometimes claims departments set thresholds and uh, catastrophic situations. Anything below a certain threshold is just automatically paid off, paid out. Um, so it's a, a very difficult from a claims adjustment uh, standpoint. Um, this is a reconstruction. We, we were able to collect a lot of claims data and, and uh, use satellite imagery and a lot of on the ground reconnaissance to recreate uh, one particular very severe fire event in San Diego, California, uh, called the Cedar Fire. It occurred in 2003. Um, and what, can, what you can see about the smoke from the Cedar Fire is that you know, this fire, this is a time progression slide of the Cedar Fire. So each day is represented by a different color. And you can see how the fire traveled. But you can see that around the third day of the fire, uh, the winds changed directions. So first, the fire spread down towards town. Um, and the left extent of that blue fire footprint, that is one of the most densely populated areas in all of California, quite frankly. It's a, it's a very densely populated area in San Diego. So there were tons of evacuation orders, lots of, you know, displacement, uh, you know, a fair amount of business interruption as businesses closed, people evacuated, um, and the smoke caused a lot of damage in town as well. But around, but, but, the, the smoke was driven by these seasonal winds called the Santa Ana winds. They go from east to west and they are seasonal. But around the third day of the fire, you can see that those seasonal winds died down and the more common sea breeze that comes off the Pacific Ocean took hold. And it pushed that smoke from town all the way eastward into the mountains where there are relatively few structures or people. But you can see on either side of the burn footprint, there's a lot of smoke concentration. Um, and, uh, and this is sort of the perimeter that you can see of where that smoke was most likely to lead to an insurance claim. So that's the hazard side. You know, I, I um, just wanted to put in a summary of uh, uh, of the Fort McMurray fire. I think that was, you know, for the Canada market, the turning point for wildfire risk management. Um, and, and that occurred, you know, in the wake of this, this terrible fire uh, in Fort McMurray, um, which was around 3.6 billion of insured loss, but uh, some estimates put the economic losses over 10 billion. Uh, 2,400 homes and structures destroyed. So that's homes, uh, businesses, outbuildings, stuff like that. A, a very high number of uh, people evacuated um, from this fire. And then uh, even more that were displaced for an extended period of time due to contamination from the fire. Now from a modeling and a, a scientific perspective, the conditions, we look at the conditions that, uh, uh, that were on the ground, as we call them, antecedent conditions at the time of the event. And these were uh, very uh, high temperatures, dry vegetation uh, from low snowpack that year. So, uh, so the moist the, the vegetation was able to dry out from these high temperatures. Uh, low relative humidity at the time, and uh, and high winds, gusty uh, as well as sustained high winds. So you take all of these conditions together and you add a spark and the cause of that spark uh, is still technically unknown, but, uh, but what they say it was probably human, probably human. Uh, and by the way, as an aside, it's estimated that 85% of all ignitions are human caused uh, directly or indirectly, and which is another reason that uh, fire, fire is so difficult to model. Um, but all of the conditions lining up uh, and the wind that caused this fire to grow into truly catastrophic proportions um, was what uh, I think uh, allowed these kind of terrible damages to happen. Um, so I think that 
if there is any silver lining to this, that, that there it is that there will be greater awareness for home safety, better risk management strategies, um, and a lot more uh, effort being put into mitigation from both the homeowner perspective and and hopefully from the insurance company perspective to be able to offer the right penalties and credits for good and bad behavior on structure level mitigation. So uh, once the fire hazard is calculated, um, the second step in modeling is determine how much damage is caused to the structure based on that fire hazard. Um, and uh, the way that CAT models handle fi uh, fire vulnerability is uh, the inputs into that vulnerability are somewhat similar to uh, other natural catastrophe models like hail and earthquake and stuff like that, where those, those primary determinants are things uh, like occupancy, construction, uh, height, you know, number of stories, year built, floor area, stuff like that, or what a property underwriter would call COPE data, construction, occupancy, protection, exposure. There are some fire specific variables into structure vulnerability. Um, and that is uh, site specifically, uh, you can have hazard adjustments with slope. Houses on slopes are more susceptible to fire loss than houses on flat grounds. A uh, distance to vegetation, or as we, uh, as is sometimes called defensible space, is a, uh, a big influencer that in low to medium sized wildfires can often mean the difference between total destruction and nothing at all. Uh, wildfire has sort of a, a, a binary type outcome like that, where you know certain times you will see on a block, three or four houses burned entirely and two or three houses that survived completely intact. Um, so this mitigation and defensible space is very important. And then the fuel type, what's burning um, influences uh, a structure's vulnerability. On the safety side of the house, models have what's called secondary modifiers that, that influence the house's outcome to fire loss. Um, roof characteristics are very important. Uh, ember accumulators, uh, like gutters, things like that, convex spaces in a complex roof. Uh, infrastructure accessibility, uh, certain other community factors. In our model, we have around 500 different flavors of damage curves depending on uh, various permutations of the uh, inputs and variables that you see here. So, um, you know, as an industry, it's up to us really to raise awareness of, of home safety and mitigation. And I think this, this slide is sort of a visual representation of some of those influencers of wildfire risk that I think we need to be really focused on. Um, roof age, uh, shape, condition, um, cladding and windows, um, and then things around the perimeter of the structure, especially distance to vegetation. Um, these things really move the needle on the ignition probability of a house given a certain amount of fire hazard. And these are just some additional influencers of wildfire vulnerability of a structure. Um, again, I point out slope, but as well as slope setback. Slope, you know, obviously influences fire risk negatively. Houses on slopes can either be subject to fires racing downhill or uh, fires traveling uphill and sort of preheating the structure by the time it reaches. But if a house is on a setback, it kind of kills your view a little bit, but it, it puts you uh, at a much safer perspective from uh, ignition to a wildfire. So it's a little bit of a trade-off there. Um, and then decks, things, it, you know, it's not just about the structure, it's about things attached to the structure, um, decks uh, and, and any opportune instruction. And then any point of weakness where embers can travel and get inside a house. Because once embers are inside a house, the ignition probability can be very high. And that's what you see here. So it's worth repeating, it's really not just about the structure, but also the things around it. Fences, decking, decorative vegetation, garages, sheds, opportunist structures. These all play a role and they can really increase the main structure's fire susceptibility 
And I think data collection practices in the industry need to accommodate this reality of fire safety, that it's just not just about the main structure itself. I think there are some really exciting technology plays in this space where you have lots of satellites looking down at every rooftop in Canada and artificial intelligence that can recognize, oh, that's a shed. Oh, that's a swimming pool. That's a trampoline. Uh, oh, there's, there's dangerous vegetation around the structure. There's tree overhang on a house. Artificial intelligence is enabling this kind of intelligence, and I think it is going to really improve fire and wildfire underwriting, um, particularly at the point of underwriting uh, structure by structure basis. So there's justifiably a lot of talk about safety and uh, mitigation in, in, uh, in the wake of some very large losses to the industry. And I think that's a very good thing. Um, but it needs to be said that wildfire risk mitigation is truly a team sport. You know, homeowners bear the responsibility of good maintenance to reduce fire risk, land planning, uh, needs to face the reality of elevated fire risk in new construction areas. Regulators will play a role in enforcement and creating a legal framework for management of uh, this wildfire peril. Um, and insurers are obviously going to play uh, a role, hopefully with mitigation credits like the ones that we have seen developed for other perils like wind and hail. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity there for the industry. But all parties need to band together uh, to play uh, a role in reducing the overall risk. So these are just uh, some conclusions and takeaways before we open it up to Q&A. <clears throat> in, in parts of Canada, wildfire can now be considered a peak peril capable of multi-billion dollar losses. Now saying that fire is a new peak peril, that is a bold statement. You know, typically peak perils have been, uh, discussion of, of that term, usage of that term has been limited to earthquake and hurricane, stuff like that. I think wildfire we have seen uh, can cause losses of that nature. The analytics used for fire risk need to catch up to this reality. Um, you know, the industry has really changed the game and improved its data collection and analytics practices for earthquake in the 80s, for hurricane in the 90s. Uh, for terrorism in the new millennium, for tsunami in the wake of 2011 in Japan, and now it's time to change the game for wildfire. So these analytics need to be used consistently, not just for underwriting, but also for reinsurance purchase, for portfolio management, for setting tolerances in risk appetite, and they need to be used consistently. And I think there's work to be done in data collection. The better data that we have, the better outcome all of us will be ha will have in terms of incentivizing homeowners for better safety, encouraging better behavior, and this is not only going to be good for insurers, but also homeowners and ultimately communities. So I'd like to thank you very much for your time today, and I am happy to uh, open it up to any questions that you might have. Excellent. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, and uh, we do have quite a few people on the line here to give you a couple of couple of seconds to think about questions. Um, I, I had a question myself uh, first. Um, so you mentioned the the Tubbs Fire in the Coffee Park example of uh, a neighborhood that was considered to be low risk, um, but it ended up being totally wiped out. Uh, and you indicated that the embers had traveled about two kilometers from the hazard fuel. Um, I think there are probably many areas of, of Canada that are similar. I'm, I'm wondering if you can share any any general information that uh, might have been uh, or may, may have become clear throughout the development of your, your work here about perhaps the proportion of Canadian homes or businesses or area of the urban area of Canada uh, that might be uh, vulnerable to uh, wildland fire impacts. Yeah, so, and this is with regards to sort of urban configurations. Well, I guess there are two parts to that question. There's the embers, you know, uh, fires generate embers and embers travel. 
And, you know, I think any anyone in a fire exposed area is going to be subject to the the embers, ember travel. Um, by some accounts, the majority of ignitions of homes cause, uh, are caused by these embers, these flying chunks of fuels. The urban conflagration, like you mentioned in Coffee Park, <clears throat> when applied to Canada, I think you're going to find that they are uh, relatively small geographic pockets of very dense exposure. So you can have a, a lot of exposure in a neighborhood. Um, it, in order for these urban conflagrations to happen, um, you have to be downwind from an area that's going to throw up a lot of embers. So you need a specific type of fuel. Uh, you need a very intense fire, and you need a predominant wind in some direction. And our climate simulation takes into account, you know, which tra which uh, directions the winds tend to travel over periods of time. Um, so overall, I, you know, I don't have any figures ready for the amount of, uh, uh, you know, the proportion of Canada that could be subject to an urban conflagration, but I think you'll find it uh, of limited individual pockets uh, of neighborhoods that, that have an exposure, a uh, high exposure concentration. Uh, urban conflagrations also require houses to be pretty close together because when a fire jumps from one house to another, to another, to another, you can't have houses on one acre lots or half acre lots. They have to be kind of jammed together. Um, so it's those areas where the houses are close together, they're downwind from embers, and the fuel is the type that um, that really generates these, these big embers that can travel a long uh, direction. Um, we'll be able to provide a, a, you know, a lot more detail when we sort of finalize this model. But I think uh, one thing you'll see is that uh, that's the beauty of the catastrophe model is, you know, you let it run for 50,000 simulated years and it's going to tell you stuff about certain neighborhoods that you thought were safe, that the model is telling you, you should look closer. And that's something that we hope to share uh, very soon here. Okay, thanks very much. There's actually quite a few questions here, so I'm going to work my way through, uh, through them and hopefully we get to all of the questions. Uh, before the end of the, the presentation. First, uh, I should head off a couple. Um, we do plan with Mark's uh, um, permission to post the, the slides on our website and a YouTube copy of the video on our, our YouTube site. So we'll uh, have that all available probably by next week. Um, so one, one question from an attendee, um, does your model take into account current fires burning? If so, uh, do the results change day to day? No, no. So I, I guess what, what we read, we, we uh, represent the 2019 risk level with today's fuels and today's climate. Um, and we give some credit for trends that we see in, in um, fire sizes. Fire sizes are getting bigger. We give some credit to that, but we're calibrating to a long-term view of risk. Now, I guess I get this question a lot, like what if there's a fire this year? Uh, or what if there was a fire last year? This year it should be totally safe, right? How do you model that? Well, the answer is, if, if there was a fire in the vicinity last year, fires do not burn evenly. And within the confines of any fire footprint, you're going to have areas that are completely untouched. And you'll probably have areas that are just charred to the ground. So it's very uneven. Um, so it, is, uh, it would be incorrect to say that just because a location was inside a fire footprint last year, it has no chance of burning this year. Um, that's, uh, you know, I think there are, there are lots of fire footprints that burn one year after the other year. Now, in our simulation, we will never allow the same cell to burn twice in the same year, but there are occasions, uh, once in a blue moon, where, um, especially in grass-dominated areas, where you have uh, a lot of precipitation, the grass grows back, and then you can have a fire the next year. Um, our model reads off uh, usually land fire grids to classify the fuel. So if you geocode one house in one neighborhood, it's going to look on a land fire grid to say the fuel type is timber or the fuel type is grass. Uh, you can always override the model for these geohazard characteristics. So if there was a severe fire, you can just set it to non-burnable. Um, you know, if the house is on a different kind of slope, you can override the slope. So we have levers in the model that allow to override certain geohazard characteristics. 
Hello. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there's actually a number of questions here about data sources and validation of uh, of some of your variables, um, specifically from Vanya and Marcus. Uh, well, I guess I suppose all these questions are coming from the same place, so I'll ask them at the same time. Uh, but there's a question about what your source of fuel and ember data uh, were and uh, how the smoke damage uh, in the model was validated uh, given the fact that uh, there may not be much data um, in Canada due to a few, only a few loss events. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there, there are certainly fewer loss events in Canada than there are in California, but we collect insurer claims data uh, as a uh, manner of calibrating our models. We have these you know, development partnerships where we work with individual insurers and in exchange they give claims and exposure data. Um, you know, for, for fuel, I think, you know, I, I'd have to look, but, you know, NRCAN, Natural Resources Canada, um, uh, releases some good information for both fire spread and I think uh, for uh, fuel classifications. I published the source of the, the fuel classification was on the slide that I have comparing the U.S. and the um, Canadian uh, data provenances and that, that deck will be on the website. And for Amber Travel, um, you know, as I mentioned, the U.S. Forestry Service and NRCAN definitely have different fire prediction systems that they used. We started with those fire simulation frameworks. We, um, we retrofitted them to accommodate ember travel with proprietary analytics used by our engineers. Um, and then we validated that with observed on the ground damage from historical events, um, uh, you know, from, uh, uh, you know, reconnaissance and from insurer claims data. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to throw uh, three more at you right now. Um, so first, uh, two two clarifications from Marty Alexander. Uh, one, uh, he states that uh, the Australians were writing about um, spotting influence on building condition uh, going back to the 1940s. He also argued that uh, perhaps the winds during the Fort McMurray fire were, were not uh, high. They were in the range of 20 to 25 uh, kilometers uh, per hour. Uh, so I'll leave it to you uh, to, to respond to those. But one, one additional question um, is about a specific fuel type. Um, and I don't think it was mentioned in, in the presentation. So this is from Shana, uh, Shana uh, who states that there is growing concern around peat bogs in their dry dry out via climate change and drought. Uh, there's significant carbon source and uh, will burn hot and deeply uh, when compared to a forest fire, uh, which is more linear. Uh, does the model you use indicate what uh, the impact of these slightly different wildfires will be? No, you know, I think we're using the same, we're using a land fire grid, we're using public fuel grid. <clears throat> so to the extent that that grid takes into account uh, uh, peat bogs and other, you know, diverse vegetation uh, regimes, uh, so would we in our model. Um, you know, I think that that question is, is similar to the question that we get in California, where there's a, a devastating outbreak of bark beetles that are eating up trees in the Sierra Nevadas, and you have these giant patches of super dry dead trees. How is that taken into account in the model? And the, the way that I say these things uh, we are implicitly accounting for that stuff in the um, in the distribution of fire sizes in our model. You know, we we look at the trend of historical sizes, which is alarming in terms of fire sizes, and uh, and how they're getting bigger and bigger. Um, and you know, we think some of that has to do with the fuel landscape that's changing and drying out. Um, so so we're calibrating to this fire size distribution. Um, for uh, I guess for the yeah for the ember yeah, yeah I'm uh, I'm not an academic so uh, that's not my jam but I think we were we used uh, uh, the Albini equations in the 1970s um, to uh, as a basis for um, the the starting point at least in, in ember travel and then we added a bunch of our uh, our own sort of proprietary analytics to that um, and then there was one more question in that and I can't remember what it was. <laughs> Uh, right. <laughs> I think there was some, uh, or maybe I got all three. I don't know. I think, I think you got most of those. Uh, okay, okay, cool. Let us, let us know if you missed something. Um, so there, there's another question from Marty Alexander. I think you might've already answered this, uh, seeing that you're not an, an academic. Uh, 
Uh, but there, you know, you developed some novel approaches here. Um, and is there any plan to have uh, the modeling research uh, published in, say, peer-reviewed uh, journal? Um, frankly, we think we're way out ahead in the market in what we've produced. Uh, if the market catches up, then at that point we kind of publish. But we have to balance what we think is a competitive differentiator with um, kind of, you know, business realities. Um, in other perils, hurricanes, notably, uh, and hail, um, you know, typically we're, we tend to be on the cutting edge of research. And then as our analytics are adopted more broadly, then we throw out some peer-reviewed publications and stuff like that. So I think that's probably the playbook that we're going to follow uh, for uh, wildfire. So I would say uh, nothing is probably forthcoming in the next year or so. But after that, uh, I think you'll see uh, publications from us. Okay, thank you. Um, so another question, we were talking earlier about um, whether you would consider, say, specific area within the model, uh, you wouldn't allow it to burn twice in the same season. I think I, that's what I, what, I, what I gathered from your response earlier. Uh, so I got a question from one of our attendees. Uh, what would you think would be a reasonable timeline to consider for a wildfire recurring at a previous location? <clears throat> it, that really depends on the fuel landscape. I mean, in, in, in California, we've seen gra grassy areas just because California is such a uh, bountiful soil that produces such lush vegetation that uh, if a, a fire burns a, a grassy area, it can totally burn the next year because the grass just springs up again. But that's not the case with timber. If you have a canopy fire that just chars a bunch of timber, you know, it's probably going to be safe in that immediate area from a uh, fire. Um, so it's hard to say. I would say, I, again, within a fire footprint, you're going to have areas that are completely burned and areas that are untouched. So it's, it's entirely possible that within even a couple of years, you will have overlapping fire footprints. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, you know, that, that's as much as I can say on that. But um, again, we, you know, we allow some discretion um, in overriding the model to just set some cells to non-burnable um, to be able to allow that flexibility. If you set a cell to non-burnable in our model, then the only thing that it will be, the only way that it can be damaged is either being recipient of embers from upwind or being the recipient of smoke, smoke travel from upwind. The fire itself is not going to burn that cell. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so a question here from Daryl. Is there a single North American model or several regional models? And how does the resolution of the model vary across the regions covered? Yeah, the resolution I think is similar. I mean, the, the, we read 50 meter resolution <laughs> for, you know, slope and terrain and aspect and, uh, and fuel and stuff like that. The output of the fire hazard is 250 meters uniform resolution. I think that's the same for US and Canada. Um, we wanted to use Canadian fire uh, technologies to build a Canadian model instead of, uh, you know, instead of you, you see, you'll see other modeling vendors, you know, treat Canada like some kind of extension of the US. We're not doing that. We're using native Canada tools to build a natively Canadian model. And the fire spread and the fuel data is different. Um, and I think those differences um, have emerged over decades uh, because the fire regimes are very different. So one of the things that we're looking at in uh, some interesting things that we're looking at in sort of how we uh, calibrate and validate the model is we are letting the fire spread simulation go for several thousand years just north and just south of the U.S.-Canada border and seeing what those differences and similarities look like uh, as a way to inform other more fundamental um, model parameterization decisions that we have to make. Um, but uh, to, to make a long answer uh, shorter, um, our U.S. model is the U.S. 48 states, um, and there are different hazard regimes 
for the forestry service that we incorporate in there. Um, and the Canada model um, is all continental Canada, below, below a certain uh, lat long that I showed it, uh, in one of the map slides. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, question from Thomas. Uh, do your models account for changes in antecedent conditions, uh, i.e. if you had run the model at the beginning of 2015 versus 2017 or 2018, would there have been different results uh, in is giving these benefits of California? So we, we released the model and we're basically, if you can think of a 50,000 year uh, uh, simulation, it is simulating 50,000 iterations of 2019. Um, but we are giving more weight to some of the trends that we're seeing in fire sizes and stuff. Um, and we're calibrating to loss targets. You know, we have losses that are targeted particularly for Slave Lake and Fort McMurray. Um, so uh, what we are doing to enable, uh, um, to enable exercises like, gee, what is my risk at the beginning of fire season compared to at the end of fire season? This is, these are sensitivity tests that in particular hedge funds are very interested in running uh, for various financial reasons. And we have enabled that by sort of tagging a bunch of event data to every one of the, you know, uh, four or five million fire events that come out of the Canada model. So for every fire, you'll have the, <clears throat> uh, the wind speed, the temperature, the date, the month, um, the time that, that uh, every, you know, every cell has a timestamp for when it burned, uh, whether or not there was an urban conflagration, what the ambient moisture was. So you can isolate all of the fire events over 50,000 years, those that are just in June or those that are just in October, um, and run various sensitivities to droughts, high, condition, uh, high temperature conditions, you know, windy conditions, potentially signals with ENSO, um, stuff like that. We are sort of experimenting to enable those kind of sensitivity tests, but fundamentally, yes, we will reparameterize the model as, as often as necessary to reflect today's risk landscape. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I know you mentioned uh, some of the sources of your data earlier, but we had a few, actually a number of questions about uh, some of the resources you mentioned earlier in your presentation. One was the uh, the WUI fire map for Canada, and there were some questions about your sources of information for natural and man-made uh, ignitions. Um, so just to quickly uh, remind us where, where, you, uh, where you received that data from. It's a good question. The WUI map, gee, I think it was someone named Lynn. Uh, she's great, and I think it came out of her doctoral dissertation or something like that. Um, I will check. Lynn Johnson, who I think is actually on the line uh, right now. Aha, uh -huh, fantastic. She does great work. <laughs> um, and yeah, this, this comes from, so we have a lead hazard uh, guy that, that, that Lynn has interacted with a little bit, Auguste, um, and he is sort of the, um, the keeper of all of our uh, fire hazard data. What, what was the other uh, uh, sort of, oh, the natural and man-made. I don't know the source of, of, uh, of the ignition database that we have, but I will say looking at natural versus man-made and then human cause versus in, indirect versus indirect versus unknown uh, ignition attribution uh, data is, is not super good overall. It's pretty spotty. Um, because sometimes you just don't know where the fire started. But suffice to say, I think the majority of ignitions uh, are human caused, um, either directly or, you know, indirectly from downed power lines and stuff like that. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a, a number of sort of specific questions. Before we get to those, one, one additional question um, about uh, the sort of site specific factors. So you'd mentioned a number of site-specific vulnerability factors like building construction and decks and location of building relative to slopes and importantly uh, well what you refer to as defensible space I think what we call in Canada priority zones uh, but basically the control of, of fuel around the building um, just to remind us a little bit about how that site-specific data is is considered and, and 
Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we'll use, um, you know, various uh, flavors of satellite derived image uh, imagery to get stuff like um, uh, distance to vegetation, you know, to flammable vegetation that, you know, the issue is when we're modeling a whole country and, there, and, and we have to use a default value for every parcel in Canada that, you know, the resolution of this is going to be 50 meters or something like that. So you're either going to get a value of zero if the house is abutting vegetation or you will get a, a value of, of 50 meters. You know, if there's vegetation way far out, you're not going to get a value in between in those priority zones. Um, you're never gonna get a, a native satellite derived data of five meters or 15 meters. That's where insurer data collection becomes really important. Uh, we can give you a pretty accurate slope value. You know, we have slope data layers, but um, defensible space and, and uh, you know, what kind of overhang there is, what kind of gutters there are, what the cladding looks like, this is stuff that needs to come from insurer's own data. And there are some interesting insure tech startups that are trying to enable uh, that kind of data for, you know, every single property in all of North America. Um, uh, and, and I think the better data that can be collected about individual site level characteristics, the better answer the model will ultimately give you. And the uncertainty will be reduced um, and the precision of the answer will be increased. Okay, excellent. Um, so a couple of final questions, I suppose, from uh, some of our attendees, Cynthia and one additional attendee. Uh, well, ba basically, both their questions are, are about accessing uh, the model. And specifically from Cynthia, has RMS developed a point of underwriting tool um, for Canadian properties? Yeah, later this year, there's going to be a whole bunch of um, downstream data that falls out of this model and is put behind an API. And I don't want to say too much about the data, but you send an address to the API and it will give you back lots of information on the fire risk. Uh, how many fires have burned in the past 30 years, et cetera, et cetera. That's, I will, that's all I will say in the course of this webinar, which is not supposed to be commercially focused. But I would be happy to answer any questions, uh, and my contact information is uh, uh, on LinkedIn or through RMS. Great. Thanks very much. And there are, uh, I think we'll wrap it up there, but there are a number of additional questions, and, uh, and I think uh, you can uh, contact Chris uh, with your, your questions. There's a number of very specific questions here, um, and I think those are, those are best left at, uh, for questions directly to, to Chris, I think. Um, thanks very much, uh, our attendees. Uh, we had actually a, a extremely large group today, one of the biggest that we've had over over 150 people, up to 160 people online. Uh, so certainly a topic of, of interest um, here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chris, for taking the time to explain uh, your work uh, to us. And uh, before we sign off, uh, any any last last thoughts? Um, yeah, no, I would say I, I'm, I'm really happy that there's such attention being paid to what I think is a very important peril. And I think a lot of good is going to come out of these learnings from these very terrible events in terms of better safety, better land use, and hopefully more sophisticated insurance practices. Okay, great. Thanks again, uh, Chris. Um, and thanks to uh, Tracy for helping us with the webinar technology. Uh, everybody, please watch your inbox for our next uh, Friday forum, uh, which will be occurring in, in late May. Um, and uh, with that, uh, we'll end the webinar there. Thanks again. Great. Thank you.